Welcome to this evening's main LitFest program. Rebecca Tracer in conversation with Carrie Orson, moderated by Susan Connolly. We are in for a serious treat tonight. I am Jefferson DeVicki. I'm the archivist for the Maine Women Writers Collection, where we are passionate about preserving, collecting, preserving, and sharing Maine writers' work. Writers who identify as female, feminine, trans feminine, or non binary. On behalf of our director, Jennifer Tuttle, and the rest of the staff, I want to say how thrilled we are to be co sponsoring tonight's event with the Portland Public Library, Mechanics Hall, and Mechanics Hall. Uh, I want to say also that we're grateful to the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance and Colby College for putting this festival together. It's been an incredible week and tonight is sure to be a highlight. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone so very much for coming. It's a deep pleasure to see you all. Rebecca, Carrie, hi. Hi. Is this working? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you both write so resonantly and fluidly and granularly about um, this moment in time and um, political and environmental injustices and I'm a keen, keen reader and appreciator as you know. We were just talking in the green room about how we all have descended from many generations of working class manners. We all write about power in different ways and about women and the environment and authority and equality and facts and how to leverage them um, and we're going to thread a needle tonight. We're just going to kind of move around and thread a needle. Um, when I asked Rebecca this week to articulate what was coming up for her a lot in her work as a woman journalist, and she may or may not remember this, um, she went right to what she called political journalism. And she said, you said, I spend most of my magazine writing life bucking against hollow journalistic ideas about distance and objectivity. The latter of which I think is an invented concept that is neither possible to achieve and also a way to justify the powerful passing judgment and continuing to shape the stories of the less powerful. The first of which I find impossible to feel in the midst of reporting on questions of injustice, power, health, and democracy. So I thought we might start there with a snapshot of something you're both working on now in your writing life that's moving you, inspiring you, perhaps angering you, and coupling it with this idea of journalistic objectivity, and, and how you experience that, and if you ditch it, or you never believed it in the first place. And Rebecca, maybe you could start. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so very pleased to be here with both of you. Okay. <laughs> um, it's such a huge question to start with. I'm going to pick apart. Yeah. One piece of it, the very last thing you said, which Beautiful. is this question. So I have my day job. I earn my living as a magazine journalist. And um, increasingly, probably over the past 10 years, it's really political journalism, right? I also write about culture and I do cultural criticism as a journalist, but increasingly it's like I write about electoral politics. I have mixed feelings and social movements. Um, and I have some mixed feelings about that. But, but the question of objectivity has become more and more fascinating to me. Because when I was a young journalist, I was really trained, I mean, in my 20s, I'm 47 now. So 22 years ago, I got my first job in journalism. And it was not with any, I, I didn't have the glimmer of writing from any kind of feminist or ideological perspective. I was like learning how to get on a phone and cultivate sources and what on the record and off the record meant. Like that kind of journalism as plumbing, right? Um, and when I was taught journalism as plumbing, which I'm really glad I was, I was absolutely, it was hammered into me that distance and objectivity were absolutely key, that there were two sides, and that your responsibility was to capture both of them equally, um, that it was important to get, and this actually continues to make more sense, important to seek out multiple perspectives, right, and that there was not, and, and that your, your own opinion, unless you were writing criticism, should not come into your life as a reporter. And so the 22 years since have been a process of me, sometimes slowly and then sometimes all at once in big gulps, completely rejecting all those 
lessons um, about objectivity. And I am very lucky. My career path has permitted me to carve out a role where I can do political reporting. It's very hard. There are probably a lot of journalists who you read out there um, who would like to have this kind of freedom. And I just happen to have a job where I have it. And I, I'm, I'm very lucky too where I can both do the reporting, right, where I'm not writing just opinion columns, so I do that, that's part of my work as well, but I can write political profiles. I just, tonight, I am, I am finishing a political profile of a Senate candidate, John Fetterman, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I wrote a very, very long profile in, at the end of May about Dianne Feinstein, the senator from California where I can do the reporting and call 100 people and do those same, the plumbing of reporting, right? Making sure the dates are correct and that I lay out a narrative in a way that makes sense and that I have a lead that captures your attention and then a nut graph that tells you what the stories can be. Yeah, all that plumbing is still there. But I also get to make sure that the way, what I think about this story or this person, the subject, the narrative, comes through. And I have come to believe that in whatever the pursuit of truth is, because, and this is something Carrie and I were talking about earlier, and I'm gonna put it in different words that you might, there, the, there are a lot of stories, and there are a lot of truths, right? And that this notion that there's one version of the truth is a fallacy. Um, but I think I can get closer to being transparent about the story as I see it, unvarnished, clear, factual, by offering my opinion than what I was taught, which is that in order to make the story transparent, you have to keep your opinion out. Yes. Cue you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, no, uh, wait, is this better? This is better for the other way. Um, two things about that objectivity. So one, I started this thing that was mentioned in my bio called um, the Environmental Storytelling Studio at Brown University. I co-founded it with a historian there. And our, our main goal is to teach academics how to tell stories. So to marry scholarship with storytelling. Because it is of my opinion, um, and I think of thousands of other academics' opinion, that, that that their stories, they carry a, a great amount of data and information and knowledge, but these, the, their knowledge isn't getting passed on to other people because it's not in a sort of a, a vehicle of a story. And so we're going to teach them how to do that. So I think that's a little bit part of what you're saying. Second point of that is my entire book, Milltown, has anybody read it here? I know my mother hasn't, but no, I'm just kidding. She's over there in the front row. It's a it's a phenomenal book. It is a phenomenal. Book. I mean, it's, it's it's a hard book. It's a hard book for my family. But um, anyway, to forgive her for a minute. But but the 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 entire book is about this distance and proximity. And, and in fact, it became the plot of the book is me going home to me to Mexico and coming back and going home and coming back. And so what that did was give me um, both a close up view of what home is like, and a, a distance, uh, to be able to get the distance of that. And so I went at it originally as a journalist, because I was like the editor of my college paper, and I had a journalism degree, and I thought I was, you know, when I graduated from college in 1989, I thought it would be a foreign correspondent, whatever that meant. And then ever since, I've had 86 jobs since, and then, and then I became a writer, but, I did a simple essay about it in the New York Review of Books I'm called My 86 Jobs. But anyway, long story short, um, so going home and coming back and going home and coming back made me realize that there isn't that one story and that, that, um, that the truth is, is to, come, to look at both of those things. When you're close to something, you can see it in a new way, and when you're far away, you see it in a different way. And I was the perfect person to tell that story because I had left a place. But I also came back and there were people there that I still loved and, and cared about as well as the town. So it also became the plot of the book. So this idea of, of distance became moot because it was both about distance and closeness. And in fact, I don't, if you haven't read the book, I become so involved that I started like an activist group in the town. 
because I, I actually never believed in objectivity myself um, in, in my school newspaper because it was, you know, as a photographer too, you, you have a viewpoint. You look through the camera, I'm going to look through the camera a different way you are and you are. And as proven, Monica Wood's book, you know, we just saw her in the street, walking down the street. It was great. My mom knows her, my sister, and, the, and of course I know her, but she wrote uh, When We Were the Kennedys which is about my town, and I wrote a totally different book, and it wasn't competing. They're different, they're different stories, and I, it was kind of interesting to see her book come out and thinking, anyway, point is, I, I never believed in objectivity. We, we have a viewpoint. It's hard, you can't erase that viewpoint, even if you want to pretend you can, mm. I think. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's just keep going on this viewpoint. Yeah. For a moment, and the actual craft. I want to just say you can't erase that viewpoint, even if you pretend you can. I want to also just the way I've come to see it is that the people who believe they can erase the viewpoint, it's really about power, and I think that's really yes. important, right? There is within within the media, within journalism, within certain. There are people who are very used to being at the top of a power structure, and whether that means we're talking about papers of record or whatever. Um, there's this idea that there's a clean way, and that, that that conviction that your way is clean and clear, and everybody else's is muddy or perhaps emotional, really... <laughs> Viewpoint. Yeah, no, even even about that too is in in I'm sorry to keep referring to my book, but it's the only book I ever wrote, so <laughs> forgive me. But <laughs> it's what we're here to talk about, right? So um, but even history itself, which I sort of take to task in my book, is not clean and clear because it's who's writing history. You know, in, in my case it was in, in our history books about Rumford in Mexico was a guy named John Lean, and he was the PR guy for the paper mill, so what is his history book going to look like? You know, I, I always wondered what if my father or my grandfather or my mother or somebody else wrote the history book, what would that look like? So so even history itself, and, and that's what actually I started by writing my book on, is I started looking up genealogy records, we were talking about earlier too, downstairs, um, and I found my grandfather's uh, death certificate and his birth certificate, I, I kind of followed the lines of what they said, and everything on them was incorrect. So, so what, who's writing this, who's creating history, who's writing down the, uh, the, uh, the, the archives? This is all problematic even before we even get to reading a newspaper, right? What resources are we even looking at? Right. You know. Let's keep going with the emotion and the, and the anger. Um, we were talking downstairs, and, and, and you talk a lot about um, sort of this idea of a very different set of standards for men's anger, in the media and women's anger, and in the culture, in the society at large. And um, it's clear that women's anger just sometimes isn't allowed, or it gets um, tamped down or dismissed um, and mocked, and um, it looks like um, it, it looks like it never changes. Like that lane of like accepted cultural misogyny just flourishes. Um, so I want to go there, but I wanted to like complicate it a little and say, what do you do with it? Like you know it's there. Do you manipulate it? Do you leverage it? Do you, what do you do with it? I, I'm just curious. Well, the question, like, what do I do with it? Again, I'm in an incredibly privileged position in that I can earn money from, which most Right, but how do you do it? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but how do you do it, Rebecca, in a piece? Technically. Yeah, technically. How do you turn it on its head because you know it's going to be there and, and, and leverage it even? Or maybe you can't. I'm curious how you go about that. How I, in my writing, yes. well, sometimes I can't. So I will tell you a very specific story that is, is very tied to gender and power and anger and my work. So for the, let's say, 18 to 20 years, I have been writing about the world over multiple publications. I'm now at New York Magazine. I have been at the New Republic, 
the New York Times Magazine, Salon, the New York Observer, right? I've been writing about abortion. And I've done it, I have done it. You name a way to write about abortion, and I have written about abortion. I wrote about, I have written about the Tea Party and how it said it was about economic policy, but really it was about defunding Planned Parenthood. I have written about my family's history of abortions and how you ask one question and you suddenly maybe find 12 abortions. About how I have I have written about the the judicial politics. I have written about the policy. I have written about how Roe was in peril. I have done, I mean, I have done it from every, I've done opinion columns, I've done reported stories, whatever. I've also had the experience in those 20 years. Now, part of my job in this world is that sometimes I have to go on cable television or NPR or whatever and do the thing where you're talking at or like whatever. I've also had the experience of every time I write about abortion, no one ever wants me to talk about it in any other venue, right? Like, literally, I, there was one time I was booked to talk about a story I wrote about abortion and I went on a show I regularly go on and in the makeup chair beforehand they were like, can you talk about the debt ceiling instead we change the program? <laughs> I was like, I'm not totally clear what the debt ceiling is, so that's not going to really over almost two decades of writing about abortion from every angle and actually like having been given the opportunity to talk about all kinds of things I write about in big public venues but never abortion, nobody ever wanted to talk about abortion. So in December of last year, there were the oral arguments in Dobbs. <clears throat> and I actually went to my bosses. I had published a big book about women's anger. I had made money from that book. I had been, people wanted me to come and talk, and, and I said all the time then, like, I'm lucky. I get to literally yell in every venue, and it just enhances my brand, right? So, which is, which is a totally, and it is, it actually, I'm, I, I'm constantly aware of it, because so many people come to me and say, I'm so angry, I just found out I'm being paid a quarter of what my junior male colleague is making me paid. How do I express it? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I don't actually have a prescriptive, like, it's, there are all kinds of prohibitions and punishments and all kinds of baggage, and there's not an easy solution for it. Here I have this clear path. But here comes December, and all of a sudden I start getting calls from television networks and being like, what will you be writing about dogs? And I was like, fuck no. I'm not writing about dogs. I called my, I called my editors in maybe November, and I was like, I'm not doing this. I've done it for 20 years. It's too late now. It's happening. This is before the oral argument. I was like, it's done. There's actually nothing to do about it now. It's done, and I have tried to do every fucking thing I knew possible to do, and none of them, and nobody ever wanted to talk about them, and I'm not, I'll be damned if I'm gonna go and talk about them now. So there's this moment where I was so angry that I was like, the only solution that seemed to make sense for me professionally was to not say another word about it. Now, then there was the oral argument, and I was so angry about how people responded to it that I wrote about it. <laughs> Then in the spring, we are coming up on, it was like, well, what are you gonna do? This, what's your next big feature? And again, I said, I'm not doing jobs. And I, that is actually how I came to write a really long, like 10,000 word profile of Diane Feinstein. It was a way of taking my anger and writing about a senior figure in the Democratic Party who I was very angry, like the party that I am very angry at, it was a sideways way of telling another story as a sideways entry. Like, here is a person who has literally been in power in the party whose job it was to defend abortion rights and access, who has remained in power as those rights have been eroded steadily, not all at once, but steadily and horribly over decades, and who is going to remain in power, right? That was my pitch. I'm not going to look directly at the thing I'm livid about. I am going to write this sideways story. I love that. I, I, I'm sure many of us have read that piece, right? And I love hearing that backstory to it. It was such a great piece. And it was, um, it was so sly and smart about how it walked around Diane Feinstein, you know, 360 degrees. But I, I will also say that coming up then, I was writing that long piece, and then there was this moment where we're getting closer and closer, and I was sort of looking around, and there are great people who are doing great abortion coverage, but not in a lot of the big publications, right? And I was like, I don't mean to say it like that. That actually sounds incredibly, there were, there were people, but in the advance, it's like people were in such denial, there actually wasn't a ton of journalism in the run-up. 
to it. And so then I wound up writing multiple columns about it. Anyway, I've not written about abortion, um, but I have had. Um, I read her book, Good and Mad. It's called Good and Mad. Um, I think it, it, it was just interesting to hear you talk about that and, and that we have to go at things sideways as women to confront it. I just thought that was interesting. And I think I did that too. I mean, the things that I was mad about in, in writing about working class America, um, not just work for New Mexico, but working class America and trying to understand um, what happened. And also as I was writing the book, um, Donald Trump got elected president in our town, Mexico, went from the biggest Obama supporters in the state to the biggest Trump supporters in the state. And to try to, um, well, I knew I actually understood why from the very beginning, but I wanted to understand even more intimately why that happened. And so, so I think that my anger took my anger took the form of a book um, <laughs> that 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 I wanted to not be an apologist for what happened in the state of Maine or, or what happened in politics, but to explain to people like, that, that, that there's a lot of working class people that are very angry. So to, to, to try to explain their anger in a way by using this sort of distance and proximity. There's a lot of people that have been screwed over for 40, 50, 60 years. And, you know, I live in Connecticut, close to New York City, to my editor, my agent, a lot of people who are very progressive and liberal and they, they were very upset and, and, and wanted to blame working class people. And, and so actually in the middle of writing my book, I stopped and wrote this kind of big thing in the middle of my book explaining why people did vote for Trump. And, and not to say I wanted that to happen, but to explain it. So to, my book is more about talking about their anger and trying to, trying to translate it for other people, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that really does. Um, so let's keep talking about your writing and environmental storytelling. Mm. It feels organically to me as someone who has taught Milltown, loves Milltown, um, teaches, I teach a lot of nonfiction, a lot of hybrid forms, that it gives you inherently a little more room to move. And I'm curious, I, I know you're working on a book about Rachel Carson now. And I'm curious, will your narrator just be, will you be Carrie right there on page one? Will you wait like Rebecca Skloot did in The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks and you wait till like page 70? She didn't want to be in that book. Skloot tried not to be in that book. So, but she had done so many years of research. It's an extraordinary book if you haven't read it. Yeah, it's um, And I'm wondering, what are you thinking? You may not know yet, but how are you approaching your persona narrator? So I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the Skloot book because I, my advisor in grad school made me go through that whole book and outline it. And so I based Milltown on looking at that. Amazing! Uh, I yeah. have made a lot of my students. Did you know that? that? I did not know that. Yeah. So that's why I outlined it, and I had to. He said, "Figure out what she's doing in every single sentence." I love that. And I was like, what? So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a book critic, so that's what I do naturally anyway. But that was an intense. So, so, so I just I figured out what I was writing this Rachel Carson book about. Um, I some somebody told me that I needed to write a new biography of Rachel Carson because her uh, her old biography is old and it's boring. And sorry if she's Linda Lear if you're in the room. Uh, there's not one person I know. Uh, listen, I just I just met with Rachel Carson's nephew at his cottage in Southport, and I just met with Dorothy Freeman's granddaughter yesterday. So it's been a man to be, and they, I think they would agree it's boring too. So, um, so I didn't want to write. I, I have I have like problems with biography in general. Like I don't like the genre because I feel like we're all reading it, waiting for the part where they get to be the person that they're going to be, right? And so I think, why, why waste all that time, right? Waiting for Rachel Carson to write Silent Spring or whatever. Um, so I was trying, I was struggling with that. Like, and, and she's not that interesting in a lot of ways. <laughs> as, a, as a person, she was very private and she wanted to maintain her privacy. So I was like, 
okay, I respect that. And she didn't have a, there's not a lot of personal stuff about her. And so I came to the conclusion with a lot of help from uh, the editor of Orion magazine, Samantha Probecker, who came to Cambridge to have lunch with me. And he sat down and he's like, we'll just figure this out. Let's get some food. So I told him everything that was bothering me. And, and what's bothering me really is about um, environmental storytelling in general and, and can, can can environmental stories actually change anything? Is is my question, or, or can stories even change anything? And here I am as a writer saying that I'm just about to like cave in my career by saying no. But I don't I don't know if they can change. I don't. And then I started thinking about that question. I'm like maybe you know, I read somewhere that like, stories don't change anything. People do. So then I started thinking, can people change? And, so now I'm like an anthropologist or something. I don't know. But but this is what I'm swirling around, and it's, it goes back to this whole one story thing. Um, so the, the, the question is, can environmental stories change the world in which we live, which is an important question, because if, we, if they don't, we don't have a world in which we can live. Um, uh, yeah. That's, that's what I have to say about that. If anybody has the answer to my question, see me after. I don't have any. You have an answer? Okay, and here's what I have to say about that. Okay. <laughs> Rachel Carson got DDT banned. For, first of all, Rachel Carson never asked for DDT to be banned. That was not her premise, and she asked for it to be modified and moderated. She did not want it to be banned, A. B, the chemicals that they use now are 7,000 times worse than DDT. So has it anything changed? No, nothing has changed, it's gotten worse. So that, that, that puts her aside. What, what I think she did do is she, she did marry storytelling with scholarship, which is something I'm interested in doing. But, and, you know, maybe, maybe Upton Sinclair did it. I'm not sure. Maybe there's other people. So, so here's part of my, my attempt at answering the question. I, I mean, I also Somebody write this down. I, I, no, no, I don't know. I don't no. know if I can articulate the various things I'm thinking about. My brain is so tired right now. But, yeah, like, same. For you. so when you ask, can storytelling change anything? And then you go back and you talk and you you talk about the ways that Rachel Carson herself might be a little boring and that the previous stories told about her were might, might have been a little boring, right? <laughs> and part of the frustration, so here's what I think. So yes, my the, voice will be. So so here's what I think some kinds of stories, perhaps stories that very stories with scholarship, right? Perhaps um, stories that, the thing I seek and that I think, uh, keep in mind so much storytelling in the past has, has been, well, the scholarship can be a broad category. It doesn't mean they have to be category. academic, like the, the, just research. The fight that I have within my profession yeah. is to tell stories that are more nuanced. Yeah. Stories that contain multiple stories, where there's, that inherently challenge the notion that there's one story. Because I think like biographies, probably. Like biography, right? And so putting yourself, that's one approach, right? Like the way you, the way, the, the Skloot version, the Milltown yeah. version, right? Of making a really, noting the complexity, which is really about the complexity of trying to convey full humanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of its contradictions, and that there's not a clean, right? This goes back to the notion that there's some clean, singular way right. to see right. the world and to express it. Right. And, and that complicating it in a variety of ways. Is it marrying scholarship? Is it, right. is it interrogating the stories that have been told? Is it being increasingly open about the ways that your opinions and ideologies inform distance proximity? Distance and proximity. Whatever, all your own. So Rebecca, what do you do Let's go right back to you and that because you have, through your hard work and your your general brilliance, carved the lane. It's not like it just happened. You've carved a lane where you get to show up, right, in the piece. So this leads me to kind of my next question is, how do you embed your feminism in, for example, a Fetterman story? Or, like, how do you do that? I'm just, like, I'm really curious. Um, I, 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 there are ways you do it, I think. 
Well, I can answer that. So one of the or things, any story. One of the matter. things that I think about as I'm in conversation with both of you who teach writing, I'm like, and I think that the reason I put my head in my hands when it was like to think about what Scoot was doing in every sentence is because I was like, oh my god, the horror of anybody looking at my every sentence. Like I never. <laughs> I'm going to do no, that. No. Because I actually it makes me. And I, this is not meant to be like weirdly self-deprecating, but I'm like, oh my god, I must be such a crappy writer. <laughs> I've never, okay, so so I don't, I, I have to tell you that um, my own storytelling about craft is probably not very lucid, but I can tell you when it comes to Fetterman, and in fact, my own growth, what, it does, what does it mean to look at something from a feminist perspective? When I started out and I was a baby feminist, it was extremely one-dimensional. I had no racial class analysis, zero. I had never even taken a women's studies class, what was now what used to be called a women's studies class, as an undergraduate. I didn't have any women's history. I didn't have any history. Okay, like I got through college reading entirely like 18th century fiction and 20th century American fiction. Like that was it. That was how you know. Okay, so. And my feminism at first was very much, I, I would like to flatter myself by saying that it was a little more advanced than like some kind of girl power stuff, but it probably wasn't. It, what, the way I now, the way I have come over decades to think of what it means to look at the world from a feminist perspective is actually looking at the world and understanding a lot more about how power works. I probably, I still use feminism as the, as the sort of word to describe what I do, but mostly what I'm doing is power analysis from one direction or another. And, and gender power is like the thing that's still easiest for me probably. But when I look at a candidate like John Fetterman, there, there are a hundred different ways that gender and race come into the story. And so he is this enormous, he's a six foot eight, I don't know if anybody here has followed this race, but he is a six foot eight former football playing uh, white man running in Pennsylvania on and it, he's, it, he, <laughs> he would seemingly defy, he's pretty, he's pretty left, though he's waffled a lot on, he used to be a really, really articulate and strong um, climate change and environmental policy politician who then really um, sort of got tangled around fracking and stuff. But, um, but, He's running for this crucial Senate seat on which, like, it's kind of not hyperbole to say, like, the, the future of the planet <laughs> depends. And, and he's the kind of candidate who is this enormous straight white man would be theoretically impervious to the kinds of um, attacks on liberals as if the early or out of touch like wears hoodies and shorts in January and everything. And, and no, seriously, and political reporters, like Beltway, Washington DC political reporters, like, we've never seen anyone like him. And I'm like, actually every senator from the state of Pennsylvania, and I grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, has been a white man. So you have seen somebody like him. But, but it is also true that he wears shorts in January, which I which also tells you about like the bubble that a Beltway media lives in that they don't know a shorts guy. But anyway, <laughs> but, um, but he had a stroke in, in May. And what has happened, he's running against the TV doctor, Dr. Oz, who's a vile human being, and who has launched an attack of weakness that he's enfeebled. That he is, that he can't talk, that he's stupid, that he's crazy, and then that very swiftly turned into he's once you could cast him as weak because he's had a stroke from which he's recovering, you could begin to do soft on crime, and now the entire ad campaign is running entirely on the kinds of racist and sexist, emasculating, and in some cases homophobic um, tropes that have powered the right against the left for as long as I can remember. And they're being deployed against this enormous white man who you would think would might be resistant to them. So that's how, so it's not exact, like that's how my feminism informs that piece. I, I, I just wanna say, yeah, uh, yes. And um, I, I think, well, first of all, I have a shirt that says feminist on it, so I wear that. 
Uh, in gold letters. It's like gold, like this dress. It says feminist. Um, but I think also that I have like a living example sitting in the front row. My mother, my sister, my mother, my grandmother, my sister. I mean, we weren't, I, I don't think we even knew the word feminist. I mean, we knew, when I, I think I write this in my book, we had isms. It was like Catholicism and baptism. Thing, we didn't have like feminism. But I had such like incredible women that were strong and thoughtful and caring and I don't know, all the things, if you just want to throw out some adjectives, they were there. And, and, and my parents also both taught me, and my dad would never call himself a feminist, but he probably was, because he taught me all the sports, he taught me how to ski, he taught me how to play softball, and treat me like a boy or a girl, or whatever he taught me, he didn't care, right? Neither of them did, even though my mother dressed us in like really great clothes, which I love clothes now, but that's, that's neither here nor there, but, but they, they just said, you know, be what you want to be. And so if there's anything, like if you're any, any of your parents out there, that's like the, you can create feminists just by doing that. Like, <laughs> and, and boys too, you know. I mean, you can create feminist boys. Yeah. So you asked last week, and it's come up a lot tonight, does storytelling matter? Can storytelling change the world? Can it move the needle? Um, so I wanted to get your pulse Talk to us about the temperature of environmental storytelling right now. How, how, what's going on out there? So I'm a, I'm a book critic too, and I get a lot of books that um, people think that I want to read <laughs> about the environment. There's a lot of them that have red covers of fire, you know, like scary words on them. There's a lot of that kind of book. And then there's the other kind of book, which is like, everything's very hopeful, and there are blue covers on it. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of different environmental solutions-based books, which are, you know, how-to, how-to, but there's all those books. And then there's like, there are books that are academic books, which are really informative, but very written in jargon and for a very specific audience. Um, I'm learning a lot about that at Harvard. Um, so this is what's happening in, in, in this environmental storytelling. All these books are doing a lot of different things that are important. Like, we need to know about nature, but do we need to know about a white guy sitting on top of a mountain looking at things anymore? I mean, we need to know about nature, we need to know about animals, but, but can we, I, I'm just trying to, like, our environment has changed so much that maybe these stories have to change to reflect that kind of environment. Like, how do you tell a story about drought to make it dramatic? Because drought is like a long-term boring thing. Or the poisoning of a paper mill town. Like, how do you tell a story that has no beginning or no end? So, I'm seeing books that aren't quite accomplishing that, but I can see a lot of people trying to do that. They're, they're lobbying their efforts at something, and, and th they're not sure what. So this is, this is kind of partly why we started this thing at Brown University, is to confront some of that, but, but also to just give people a place to go that are struggling with how to write about the environment so that it both matters and that a broader audience reads it, because it, it's my contention that if a broader audience it, then there will be a critical mass, and if a critical mass reads it, then maybe something will change. Um, so, um, and it goes back to that question, can people change? Mm, yeah. So let's flip it and talk about your readership for a minute. And um, so when um, Dobbs was announced, you said, Rebecca, um, the task for those who are stunned by the baldness of the horror, paralyzed by the bleakness of the view, is to figure out how to move forward anyway. Because while it is incumbent on us to digest the scope and breadth of the badness, it is equally our responsibility not to despair. Well said, right? So. I wondered, like, I was getting the temperature of environmental storytelling, then like temperature of of readership. Are you sensing like are people activated? Are they super tired? Like, what's what's your pulse? So, so I think that 
So this is very particular about my readership. I wrote Good and Mad um, between 20, early 2017, the Women's March, and I finished it in the summer of 2018. I wrote it very quickly. It was in a recent way. But um, the, and it captures that particular moment. It has a lot of historical stuff in it too, but it, it captures that period. And a lot of what I was writing about, that I write, and I write about this in the book, was a population that was recently roused to anger. A population of largely middle class white women who became angry in many cases for the first time in their lives when Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. And what I try to do within the book um, is think about how it could be that that anger came upon, like how could you, have, there's the whole thing about being awake, right? How could you have slept up to that point, right? This is, I think this is tied to some of the stuff I was talking about, about abortion, right? But it's also a book that very deeply values, and I very much value, because I think it is to be awake to that anger is correct and necessary. And so you wanna be aware of a population that is late to anger, but also aware of how critical it is that they remain engaged, right? But then I had this very weird experience of selling it because the book was published by coincidence the week of Christine Blasey Ford's testimony, um, which like was good for the book. <laughs> but here's the thing, I have, and I'm actually, I have to write a forward to a new edition of the book and in which I'm gonna do this and it's not. Because I was on book tour between the beginning of October when Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the Supreme Court and the midterm elections of 2018 when there was a historic number of first-time candidates, many of them women, many of them young, many of them women of color, a bunch of them leftists, right, um, were running for house seats. And in that period, that's when it was going all around the country to big rooms. And my readership is a lot of the middle-class women who were new to anger. And the view that I got at that point, so a lot of that period that I've written about in the book, actually, even though Donald Trump had won, then there were a period of big, wood, big, big wins. So all these people who were new to political engagement and anger, then it was like the Women's March. It was the biggest single day demonstration in this country's history. The Women's March was insane. And if you went, like, it felt great. The world, yes. And it was all over the world, and it felt great. We were like, see what we can do if we're angry? And then there was like all this pressure applied to members of Congress, and John McCain did thumbs down, and they didn't think so, you know, they didn't overturn health care, right? It was great, because everybody was engaged, right? And then there was Me Too, and like powerful, abusive people lost their jobs, and there was, it was, there was all of this stuff that felt like, wow, now see, now that we're engaged, like we can win. But remember that this is a population that was really new to these kinds of fights. And Kavanaugh happened, I'm on the road with this book, and they've not lost yet. And I was walking into rooms where I was being greeted by hundreds of people who were like, I can't even get out of bed in the morning. And I was like, get out of bed! <laughs> That would be the message, get out of bed. <laughs> the end. Right. And it was, but it was truly about reckoning with a population that didn't have, right, class and race privilege had permitted, and, and power, had permitted a group of very powerful people to not have the lived experience through their, their lives or the generational experience necessarily of having heard from, from parents. And that generational experience is really important, which is why you hear, especially from so many middle-class white women, I heard about my mother, and this is real, I don't mean to discount this, like, oh, my mother lived through a period, you had a, had a illegal abortion, right? Right, generational stories really, really matter. But if you're talking about, about economically comfortable white women, there isn't necessarily that history there, so there's not practice of loss, of continuing to work even when you lose over and over again, because if you're fighting against power, you're going to lose over and over again. And if the reaction is, oh my god, this is impossible, then, then the fight ends, right? And so there was no, there, there was no messaging, and that's, and I felt that in a panic in a way that I haven't conveyed in the book. I'm going to write that in the forward. But like, the, <laughs> but, but that, so that underscores the piece that I wrote about Dobbs that day was that. It was not hope, and I, and I worried, I, 
you know, I worried that it was like, see, we should still feel hope. And it was like, no, it's really bad. Hope okay? is bad. Hope. Right? But it is, you, and Miriam Kaba, uh, who is a prison industrial complex abolitionist, says hope is a discipline, right? Like part of the actual labor of participating and fighting for a better world is maintaining a level of hope even in moments where there's no rational reason for you to expect to see victory, which by the way, when it comes to a lot of stuff, well, none of, like a lot of us are not gonna live to see things get better, right? And you have to be able to absorb that at the same time that you have to also understand that that does not let you off the hook for fighting for them to get better. And so that's what that piece was about, which was not hope is like, feel better guys, but like, no, you just have to keep going. And if it's gonna be hope that gets, yes, feel hope as work. Hope is a discipline. So you're not gonna believe this, but Time is passing while we're sitting here. It's passing very quickly. Um, I hate to stay here long. I know. After long. Time. Long. Um, so, if I was starting to close this out a little to open it up to questions, if I was just starting to do that, um, I would ask you. It's hard to ask this after what all this incredible um, articulation that you just did of um, hope. Um, as discipline, but, so I'll start with Carrie. <laughs> um, so, just to kind of inspire us, I think, <laughs> what, is, what is inspiring you? Uh, um, you've got the Rachel Carson book, you might have a, also another project. Wh what, why are you getting out of bed? I guess. I wanna buy a house in France. <laughs> Somebody please buy my books. Um, so, so at the same time I'm working on this Carson biography, I'm also working on, there's something else I really want to work on, but it probably won't pay as much for this house in France. But it's, um, it's called Biography of an Ordinary Woman. And I'm still picking apart this idea of biography. Um, and I want to do a biography of somebody on the Harvard campus that is either a garbage woman or like takes out the garbage or is works in the cafeteria. Because I'm really interested in the concept of work and what people do and how people are invisible and how sometimes we treat people who take care of our trash like trash. And I want to do a biography of her, but write it like a novel. Um, a very small novel, like 200 pages. So that's what's really inspiring me. I don't know if that's hopeful, but I think I think putting ordinary people, and this all stems from a thing, I started, I go to yard sales a lot, which I'm sure everybody in this room does, and I started buying um, portraits of ordinary women that were like abandoned and I felt sorry for, like a sorry stuffed animal, you know, in the corner, and they were just kind of not pretty pictures or painted like by amateurs, and they were like five dollars, ten dollars, so I started collecting them, and I, I thought, I'm gonna write a book about these ordinary women um, that, that aren't in museums, you know, so that kind of gets me out. And the, Rachel Carson is kind of a, it, she, she was actually very, very poor, too. It's something that's not talked about a lot. And she worked her ass off to provide for her family and brought up her nephew. And she did a lot of stuff, too. So she was kind of an ordinary woman in a different way. Um, but anyway, it's about work is what I'm interested in. And so I work to write about work. <laughs> I love that. Insane. I love that articulation. Thank you. Um, over here. Um, I don't know if I have a great answer for what's inspiring to me. I know that, um, I mean, I feel um, part of the badness is it can't quite go on as it has, which is good. Um, and that, I do think about that, like, I think that in terms of what I cover in politics, and, I mean, I am inspired by the people who are actually doing the work of, of helping people, right? Like, so, um, so that's true, and that's the people who have been on the ground, um, doing all kinds of creative approaches to changing 
how power works, how, how government works to, to you know, th that's always been inspiring to me. Um, I see them increasingly having influence, which is a little bit of a sunny way to put it, it's not, it's, you know. Um, we're in a, like, it, you know, this is a, a bad time. Um, it's a bad time. But there is something about that where there's like, uh, some cover is being ripped off that I think is useful, really useful. Um, it's not all the way off, you know. Um, but it's it's going to force totally new approaches, right? I see people, young people, um, questioning sort of capitalist assumptions in ways I've never seen before that I learn from every day. And I'm like, oh my god, like if this had been if this had been available to me when I was younger, like this is great. Um, and I see that happening um, in my profession, the young people in my profession. I see it with you know my kids um, and their peers. And um, you know, I, I think that the, the creativity of crisis um, is a is a real thing. And it's it's exciting to me because I feel like there's so much to learn and so many new ways that we are all going to be forced because of bad things, but we're going to be forced to think. These kids at Harvard are right, teaching a seminar there, and they're rabid to like do stuff, and it's really that's inspiring too. I have to say they are rabid about mm -hmm. engaging and feeling like they can move, do something. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. The creativity of crisis. Okay. That feels like a good place to hit pause because it's got, there's so many side doors into that house. So um, this is the moment where we do open it up to you all. Um, and our incredible um, director of main mechanics has a microphone in her hand. I do. So if someone has a question, maybe just raise your hand and, oh. I just right. want to say that I want to have the three of you in residence for the creativity of crisis. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's yes. think about that. That would okay. be good. Subtitle hope is a discipline. Mm. Thank you so much for coming. This was just, just so enriching. Um, I have a question. I teach um, undergrads and I have taught high school also history, poli sci, political theory, all of that. And I see and applaud. I don't want to say rejection of objectivity, but there's not much to objectivity. And what I hear you saying is we need to embrace a more plural approach to what meaning is. Not necessarily truth, right? But what meaning is. So when you're talking about your Fetterman piece, you're like, he can be the January shorts guy and also a straight white male who is also climate conscious, who is now also being perceived as perhaps a feeble by the stroke, right? And all of those perspectives are valid. Not one story. Correct. Um, but something that shakes me to the core that I hear from my students is there is no such thing as unbiased fact. Okay? So I ask them to do historical research or we are, we are talking through historical and they literally do not believe that any mainstream publication is what they call unbiased. And to them, unbiased means completely unreliable. And my heart drops to my feet every time I confront a student like that. Can you help me? <laughs> I could talk to you for like five hours about that, but I don't know. Um, do you want to go first? <laughs> Say some, I'm going to brainstorm out. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to say what's wrong. You guys can correct me. I, don't, I, I, I sat here right now and told you that history is wrong. So I can understand why they believe that. And I can understand why they believe that the government is lying to them. Because our government has lied to us for a long time. So, so I think their questions are right. I think they're right. It doesn't mean there is no... I mean, I don't know. If, I actually don't know if there's such thing as a one truth... Like, I really don't know. But there are certain things like, you know, if you throw a ball up in the air, it's going to land on the ground. There are certain truths that are going to happen. Okay, but we got too many kids going into STEM already, and that's why. Yeah. Right? Like, like, I'm trying to claw the back of the humanities, and they're like, oh, my Yeah, but the humanities, the humanities, um, we're both in the humanities. We're both writers, and 
all three of us, and that's the things we exactly tackle, is like to look at all those nuances of the truth. That's exactly what writing does. And I don't think, I, I, for me, I don't think there are, I don't think great writing provides answers. I think it provides questions. So I think they're kind of in the right place in a way. I, I was also gonna say like, they're not wrong. Um, but the problem is the false equivalence of yeah. is the New York Times bias equivalent to Tucker Carlson's bias or to like something they saw on Reddit, okay? That's, that's an issue. But I think we have helped to get ourselves into this mess by thinking, by behaving as though the New York Times is unbiased. And not and, and by treating facts as you know, there are some as fixed, right? But but I, so this is an obsession of mine that is sort of a, a side obsession. Me too. Because in the in the realm of journalism, like there's a huge rise in data journalism, right? One of the things I can't stand in my own profession, it's like the New York Times needle, it's the idea of certainty, right? And that and that certainty can be delivered in tweets or whatever, and that right, but that also numbers will explain everything. And there's all this stuff that sort of makes Parties like we're the like the left is the party of science and the left is the party of facts and democracy dies in darkness and like newspapers, the Washington Post and Nate Silver are gonna save us from the right and that contributes to this problem. Yeah. yeah. Because the thing about journalism, right? If you take this held up as journalism is facts, no good journalism is inquiry, right? And questions. and questions and science is facts. A scientist will tell you that science is about opening up further it's questions. It's about right? uncertainty. I read that in my book. It's, a, it's scientific uncertainty. They, they never are certain. They're never going to say that a paper mill causes cancer. Right. right. They're not going to say it. And, and that is, it is, but it is in fact, in part, I think, some missteps by those who probably are ideologically similar yeah. in holding up certain kinds of authority and using words that were never accurate to begin with about surety, certainty, data, facts, as if these things are fixed, rather than treating these stories as they are, as stories, right? So, so we help to yeah. lose this disinformation battle, or get on the wrong side of it, by, by beginning with a frame that was distorted. If, if that makes sense. So that doesn't answer like, what do you do? Except I, for me, it has been useful. So I did toy with the idea, actually. I'm so obsessed with the idea of uncertainty as a, I, I, I actually think our whole society is like hinging, and the reason why we're rocking around in this crazy boat is because of ambiguity right yes. now. And, but, and so you should just teach our books. And then, <laughs> no, um, I have toyed with the idea <laughs> of writing a book about uncertainty. Me too. But I can't figure out how to tell a story about it that is located you in the You need a story. Right, I, I need the story. I, know. Like, I, I have the ideas, I don't have the story. Yeah. But, but <laughs> a thing that has been helpful for me as I sort through it, right? Because you think about facts and, and as this somehow fundamentally progressive, and then you think about the way that numbers were, are used to say that like bias doesn't exist, right? Like that, you know, racism or sexism doesn't exist because you can't plot bias on a graph or there, you know. So, so when you, I think arguing for inquiry, questioning as, as sort of an alternative, like what gives you information? Like, I don't know how to do it as a teacher because I'm not a teacher. Well, I also want to say that if you could have been in my house this summer, this was the fight that my husband and I had with our 21 year old all summer was, he was so down with mainstream media that he refused to read, the, the, so he was conflating Reddit with the New York Times. And my, I mean, I was just, my hair was falling out and we went to the mat on it many times, but here was what I said, and it worked, which was, don't come to me with your BS ideas that you're getting from your podcasts unless you can back it up some data, and then find journalists who you believe in because they inspire you with the way they tell stories. Like, find them and follow them deeply. Follow Rebecca Traitzker and like follow her deeply so that you you at least are not just skimming the surface. Like, yeah. like they can't come to you with this if they are not doing deep reading. Find the multiple um, stories. And then the other thing I'm going to say is, I'm just going to say it, I write novels. <laughs> <laughs> So when you, when you write novels, guess what? I'm writing a novel about sex trafficking right now. It's got a lot of research, but um, I can be as biased as I want. Okay, 
All right, next question. Read novels. Oh, the yes. answer. Read novels is the answer. It actually is a great answer. Don't read nonfiction. No, it's true, though. I think novels can offer a lot of um, um, information about the truth. Um, first of all, I'm excited to read the collaboration with you about uncertainty. It's <laughs> really good. Welcome. I actually have a quick question for each of you. Carrie, I heard a uh, story in NPR a few weeks ago about an increase in climate beat reporters. I've just been thinking about that, so I'm curious about your opinion of that. And Rebecca, I'm wondering if you ever just want to write a story about like Beyonce or Netflix or something? <laughs> just for a little break. Um, about climate beat reporters, she asked if there's an increase, she heard a story on NPR is an increase in climate reporters, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know if that throwing a bunch more people at it, I, I think what needs to happen for sure is each, each, each media outlet feels like they need to have a climate, a place, and not just climate, it needs to be environment. I think climate is a word that everybody's already tired of, but like environment, which includes a lot of stuff that's happening that does, it includes, like Rick, and let's be honest, every story in the newspaper is about climate in some way or another, whether it's about a candidate, or whether it's about Yemen, or whether there's something that boils down to the environment and resource extraction or resource, um, um, we don't have enough resources. They all involve around, uh, revolve around some kind of problem with the planet. So I think what, I mean, this is real, I'm just brainstorming here, so I could be wrong. But I think they need to just really kind of, each media outlet needs to focus on, like, put it in a place so that people's minds go to that place. So it's not interspersed with the other news, so it seems like it's, or maybe it just needs to be all the news. I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, because it's in all the news, or maybe we need to put it in one place. Like, I think about book reviews. I'm a book critic, and I'm trying to place a column that just has environmental stories in it, and everybody's like, no, we cover them. I'm like, yeah, but not, not focused so that people go, oh, here's what the environmental books are. You know, it's mixed in, so it can become diluted. So there's one answer, but on the other hand, I think all stories are environmental stories. So I'm not sure the answer. If anybody can help, please help. <laughs> I mean, this is the this is the challenge perpetually. Mm -hmm. is, is it better to be siloed, yeah. where there can be depth and focus, or is it better to be reflect? I mean, and ideally, what you have is both. Ideally, you have a world in which climate, uh, gender, racial, class, all this all this stuff is woven by skilled writers through all the coverage of the world. And then there are also, there's... there's so glorious. <laughs> it's so glorious. Woven through coverage of the world. But, but then there are spaces where there's, that are reserved for in-depth, in focused writing on those subjects. The Beyonce question. I have a funny story for you. <laughs> Two minutes ago? I was having a breakdown. It was having like a genuine, I might have been crying, but I don't even think it was crying. It was just like such profound stress because it was, it was, it was, I was in a very, very bad place because I was closing the story and it just sometimes, like not, it, it, in the moment it's very self-important, like as if it really matters when it, somebody will, like it's genuinely like will go under in a birdcage like immediately upon publication. But, but in the moment where it was like, Oh my God, because the, this, this stupid race I'm writing about is so important, it's so important, you know? And it's like, the, and I was sick of worrying about the weight of every word and is it, too, you know? And, and I said to my editor, I was like, I swear to God for you, I was like, I'm writing about a pop star next. I was like, I cannot do this. And I said, remember last year, last year at this time we were moving into a new house. And I was like, I'm writing about Katie Couric. She had a book coming out. I wrote a long story about Katie Couric. I was like, remember Katie Couric? That was fun. It didn't matter. No one cared. Like, <laughs> it was fine. There were no stakes. It was awesome. Let's do that again. <laughs> um, and then that night, that same night, a, a reporter from the Times called me from the style section and was like, hey, I wanted to ask you about Paris Hilton. And I was like, <laughs> And he was like, because you wrote this really great piece 
about Paris Hilton, and I was like, I did? And he sent me a piece from like 18 years ago. It was not great, it was, but it was about Paris Hilton. So I did, used to, I did used to do that regularly, I did. I wrote about, I've written stories about Beyonce. I have written stories about Whitney Houston. I have written stories about Kate Kirk. I have written a lot of pop culture when I first started to write from a feminist perspective. A lot of it was pop culture criticism. I didn't, I, I have to say, I didn't get into writing about politics until a woman ran for president in 2006. Well, when she was thinking about it. Um, when I wrote a scathingly critical story about Hillary Clinton, who I later came to be much more sympathetic for. But um, I was, to the degree that I ever wrote about politics, when I first became a journalist, it was about the wife, it was about you, Teresa you and Nice Carrie, and the Carrie girl, it was the daughters and the wives, it wasn't, it wasn't the candidates. I mean, you can't close that box once it's open. That's part of the problem about writing, right? Like, I'm saying, when you, when you start to discover all the systemic problems, you can't just, it's hard, you, I mean, she could probably write about Beyonce, but it'd be some, like, take on it that would be, you could not write about her. No, I mean, everything her, would have the, right, the Katie Kirk thing had the, like, it was, it was the thing, it was the thing. Which is kind of comes full circle to exactly the frame for tonight, right? It's kind of uncanny that you are writing from these subjective, cisgender, you know, straight women positions, white women, and you bring that to the work, so, you're going to bring the, your feminism and your anger and your to Beyonce or to Katie Couric, and we want you to. We we celebrate that. We hope you do. Um, yay! <laughs> um, are we? So, do we have time for what, one more? Uh, can I ask? Yes. Can I, can I ask a question? I, I can, yeah. Okay. Now I can ask one. So um, I'm I'm really curious about to hear your perspective of just how broken the journalism system is. Um, I went to journalism school. I used to be a producer at BBC News. Um, and you know, there was a time in which there were, you know, the three anchors. There was Brokaw, and there was Rattler, and there was Jennings, and you tuned into one, and generally your preference had to do with whether you like to hear the way that somebody from Texas spoke, or like, you know, but it was like generally you're getting the same information. Um, and it felt quote unquote reliable. And I, I, I'm curious that, you know, clearly that, that system is no longer in place. There's no sort of like network where you can kind of tune in and you're getting basically the same information. And so, is it, but is it, so, so it feels broken, but my question for you is, is it better? Is it, is it much better? I, I would say that the, the idea, that it may indeed be broken, but it was not whole, it was not fixed before. Right. It was the, the one message coming white from guy. Broca. Right. And, and rather, three white guys. Three, yeah, 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 no, no, clear. And, I mean, and clearly. And short segments that they chose what, what to cover, right? Right. They chose for a half hour every night, those five stories that they were going to cover. And if you want to know about how nobody ever wanted to talk about abortion and the Hyde Amendment, right? That, that goes right, right after Roe, Hyde makes abortion, basically a, makes Roe moot for poor women in the, in the late 70s. So that this thing right now, 50 years later, where people are like, I can't believe I might live in a world in which we might not have access to abortion, that world began for people who were poor, disproportionately likely to be black, brown, immigrant, rural, young, right? That world has existed for the entirety of Roe. But those were not stories that were ever told on those nightly news programs by those people we were taught to understand as authoritative. Right, right. So, so was it more organized? Yes, it was. Did it offer the sheen of authority? Yes, it did. Is that sheen completely shattered? Yes. Is it better or worse? It's different. In some ways, it's more honest now. Well, you said it, taking the skin off some things a little bit, breaking those systems down. It takes a while to break a system down, you know? It's gonna take like probably a couple centuries. <laughs> it took that long to build it up. I guess I, the, the follow-up to that is, is that then how do we, 
how do we direct our younger people, how do we direct Susan's 21-year-old son and your students to a place where <coughs> they're That's able to access, I don't know, truth, information? Ask, ask and answer, I think, earlier, don't you think? I mean, a little bit. I don't, I'm not being smart pants, but I, I, I think they have to ask the questions. I should keep asking questions. And keep reading deeply. And read novels. Read. <laughs> <laughs> Don't That's read. where we're ending. Just read no, but Novels can offer a lot, I, I joke, but novels can offer a lot of um, truths about the human heart yeah. that, that well, are not necessarily in stories, especially in environmental stories, which I hope to include more of the human heart in stories. You know, yeah. we, we can't remember data, but we remember people, and we remember their, what people do, and so that can lead to a different kind of truth, you know? Emotional truth, yeah. Um, thank you, I think, is this, our, is this our time? Is our time nigh? Um, there are lots of, there's time here once we disperse to talk to these two amazing writers. They're not going anywhere for a little while. Their, their amazing books are for sale over there, so you can support an incredible local bookstore, Longfellow. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Carrie and Rebecca, so very much. Thank you. So great.